Hello, I'm Jennifer Bartlett from Paul McRae's lab at the University of Iowa. Uh, first, I would like to thank the session organizers for giving me the opportunity to share with you um, some of the work we've been doing looking at uh, responses to respiratory viral infection and the CF pig model. And I have no relationships to disclose. So one of the central questions that our lab is interested in is this idea that antiviral host defense is impaired in the airways of individuals with cystic fibrosis. Um, this idea has its origin in clinical and epidemiological literature. In, study, in studies dating back to the 1980s, clinicians have begun to note that in CF patients, it's not that they necessarily get infected with respiratory viruses more frequently, but that when they do, uh, they tend to have more severe symptoms, there's greater involvement of the lower respiratory tract, uh, prolonged recovery times, and more hospitalizations. So generally kind of a more uh, severe course of illness than is seen in the general population. It's also clear that there is a relationship between pulmonary exacerbations in CF patients and sort of seasonal changes in the prevalence of circulating respiratory viruses in the environment. Um, and you can see that uh, here, this is some data from 2003 to 2009. Uh, in this study, the authors tracked rates of pulmonary exacerbations in adult CF patients, as well as patients under the age of 18. And what you'll see is that there are these kind of seasonal spikes in the prevalence of RSV and influenza in the general population. And these spikes correlate closely with spikes in pulmonary exacerbations in the CF population. More recently, some investigators have tried to look at this experimentally using CF cell lines or primary cells derived from CF patients. Um, and these studies do suggest that uh, respiratory viruses seem to replicate more efficiently in CF cells compared to non-CF cells. And interestingly, this has been seen with multiple viruses, including parainfluenza virus 3, um, influenza, and also with rhinovirus. So one of the common themes to arise from all of these studies uh, is the observation that the interferon response or interferon signaling seems to be kind of dysregulated or altered in some way in the CF cells, um, and that this seems to be contributing to this phenotype. And so this has led to this idea that perhaps exposure to chronic inflammation in the CF lung uh, perhaps leads to like a, a permanent alteration in uh, antiviral host defense responses and CF airway epithelia. And so in thinking about this, our lab has found it useful to ask, is this impairment of antiviral host defense a primary or secondary consequence of loss of CFTR function? Uh, so on the one hand, it's possible that loss of CFTR function somehow directly uh, leads to an impairment or a loss of antiviral defenses. And in this case, this would be considered a primary defect. But alternatively, it's possible that loss of CFTR does not directly impact antiviral defense, but that instead it contributes indirectly by leading to progressive lung disease, uh, which is associated with recurrent bouts of bacterial infection and inflammation. And that over time, perhaps this causes some epigenetic changes in the cells, which impact their ability to respond to viral infections. And so in this case, we would say that the cells have altered antiviral defense secondary to chronic infection and inflammation. And so one of the challenges in this field has been that in order to distinguish between these two possibilities, what you would really like to do is look at the, the responses of airway epithelia from very young patients, ideally before the onset of infection and inflammation, uh, which is just difficult to do from a practical standpoint. It's, it's just been difficult to get samples from such young patients. And so one of the goals of our research group has been to address this challenge by using the CF pig as an animal model. Um, this gives us the ability to do experiments in newborn animals that have not yet begun to develop lung disease. So what have we learned so far from the CF pig? Uh, well, we know that at birth, the lungs of newborn CF pigs are free of inflammation and that like humans with CF, the CF pigs will go on to develop progressive lung disease characterized by uh, bacterial colonization and inflammation. We also know that at birth, the CF pigs already exhibit a defect in antibacterial host defense. 
And there seem to be several mechanisms contributing to this. Uh, so we know that the the mucus in the airways of these animals has some abnormal properties, which likely impact mucociliary clearance. We also know that in the absence of CFTR, uh, loss of bicarbonate secretion at the airway surface leads to these animals having a relatively acidic airway surface liquid. And we know from our work and the work of others that a number of the um, secreted antimicrobial proteins and peptides that are, that are present in the secretions um, have activity that is pH sensitive, and many of them don't work as well at lower pHs. And so this has led us to develop this model whereby um, in the newborn CF pigs, there is a reduced pH in the airway surface liquid. Um, and this low pH leads to an altered and reduced functioning of secreted antimicrobial proteins and peptides, and ultimately a defective ability to eradicate bacteria from the airways. So one of the first questions that we had was, um, do the airway secretions from newborn CF pigs exhibit a similar defect in antiviral activity, similar to what we see with respect to antibacterial defense? So to answer this question, we developed an ex vivo assay for measuring the antiviral properties of airway surface liquid. Uh, to do these assays, we collect airway secretions um, from the trachea or the nasal regions of newborn pigs, and we test their activity against Sendai virus. Uh, so Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus. Um, it's, it's basically the mouse ortholog of parainfluenza virus one. Um, and I should also mention that the version of Sendai virus that we use for these, for these studies encodes a GFP reporter. So to measure the antiviral properties of these secretions, uh, we incubate them in a test tube with the Sendai virus for two hours at 37 degrees. And then we assess uh, the effects of this treatment on the subsequent infectivity of the virus by taking these virus secretion mixtures and um, applying them to the surface of LLC MK2 cells. And then we look at the cells the next day and quantify the number of infected cells by flow cytometry. Uh, so this is an example of what the results of this assay look like. So here we're looking at the reduction in Sendai virus infectivity after a two hour incubation with airway secretions. What we find is that both the nasal and the tracheal secretions from, uh, from the newborn pigs have the ability to dose dependently reduce the infectivity of Sendai virus in this assay. So in other words, uh, these secretions seem to be innately antiviral. So we went on to do some experiments to try and sort of characterize this antiviral activity. Uh, we find that this activity is broad spectrum. Uh, we see similar activity against a range of sort of clinically relevant respiratory viruses, including RSV, influenza, and adenovirus. It also seems to be conserved. Uh, we see similar activity in uh, nasal secretions from humans, and it's protein dependent. So we lose the activity if we first heat and activate the secretions prior to doing the assay. So then we asked what would it look like if we test the activity of CF secretions in this assay. So here we're looking at the activity of nasal secretions from newborn CF pigs and non-CF litter mates. And what we found was that the secretions from both the CF and the non-CF pigs did have antiviral activity in this assay, but you'll notice that there's kind of an upward shift in this curve for the CF pigs, suggesting that the, the antiviral activity of the CF secretions is somewhat diminished relative to the non-CF secretions. So to kind of summarize um, with respect to extracellular antiviral activity, uh, we find that the airway secretions from newborn pigs are innately antiviral and that this antiviral activity is reduced in the secretions from newborn CF pigs relative to non-CF. Uh, we haven't really nailed down a, a mechanism to explain this difference yet, but some of the things we're considering are, uh, so, so one possibility is that there's a, a specific factor or protein that's present in the non-CF secretions and that accounts for much of this activity, uh, which is perhaps lacking or present at a lower concentration in the CF secretions. Um, it's also possible that this activity is influenced by proteases. Uh, so we know from the CF literature that 
the sort of protease antiprotease balance is altered in CF airways. And so it's possible that if there's sort of increased protease activity in our CF secretions, that this could be having the effect of cleaving and inactivating some of the secreted antivirals um, in those secretions. So um, we're also interested in learning more about antiviral defense at the level of a whole animal. And so in parallel, we've also been doing some in vivo viral challenge experiments with the newborn CF pigs. So for these studies, we decided to start with influenza as kind of our model respiratory viral pathogen. We chose influenza because we know that it's a, a virus that's clinically relevant in the CF population. Um, influenza is frequently isolated from the airways of CF patients who are experiencing uh, pulmonary exacerbations. And additionally, at the time that we started this, these studies, um, we knew that pigs are frequently used as an animal model for influenza studies. And so uh, we knew that there was a lot known about what influenza infection should look like in our pigs. So here's an overview of our experimental design. So we infected newborn CF pigs and non-CF litter mates as controls. All the pigs for these studies were delivered by C-section, which gave us um, a little, the ability to sort of control the timing of the infections um, and also helped to ensure that these pigs would have had limited prior exposure to infectious or inflammatory stimuli uh, prior to receiving the influenza. We infected them with a 2009 pandemic swine flu uh, strain of influenza. So this is an isolate that was recovered from a human patient in the 2009 pandemic. Uh, the virus was delivered aerosolized via the intratracheal route. And then 24 hours later, the animals were euthanized and we collected tissues from throughout the airways uh, to look at a, a variety of different infection endpoints. So one of the things we did was we used viral antigen staining to visualize infection in these animals. Uh, we stained for the influenza nucleoprotein. Um, and th so these are just some representative images from our pilot studies in wild type animals, just to, to give you a sense for what it looks like when we infect newborn animals with uh, this virus. Uh, so we tend to see widespread uh, kind of patchy infection throughout the airways, including in the trachea and the bronchus and down into the alveolar regions. And so then we worked with our pathologist at the University of Iowa who developed a scoring system to kind of describe the, the extent of, of staining in, these, in, these, in the tissue sections from these animals. So the scoring is summarized here. Um, so for each animal in this study, we obtained kind of an overall average score to describe the, the level of infection in the trachea as well as in the lung. Um, and so what we saw was that there was a fair amount of variability in, in the levels of infection between all of the animals, uh, but there was a tendency to see higher scores or, or higher levels of infection uh, in the CF pigs compared to the non-CF pigs. And interestingly, this difference seemed to be more pronounced in the trachea. Uh, we also did viral titering to get a sense for the viral loads in these animals. Uh, so one thing that we noticed was that in about half of the non-CF pigs, we were actually unable to detect any virus in any of the tissues that we sampled. Um, whereas for all of the CF pigs, we were able to detect virus in at least one tissue. Uh, so it sort of seemed like virus was more frequently recovered from the tissues of the CF animals. Um, and this is also reflected in the actual titers that we obtained, uh, which are summarized here in these heat maps. So on these heat maps, um, each column represents an individual pig. So we had nine non-CF pigs and six CF pigs in this study. Um, and we sampled from nine different airway regions, including the proximal and distal trachea, the bronchus, and then each lobe of the lung. And so what I think you can appreciate is that uh, there was a tendency for the tissues from the CF animals to more frequently be positive for virus. And additionally, it seemed like often the titers that we measured in the CF tissues tended to be a little bit higher than what we measured in the non-CFs. So then we also wanted to know what was going on with the innate immune responses in these animals. 
So to answer this, we use qPCR to look at gene expression in the bronchus tissue from the infected animals. And uh, so when we did this, we tried to look at some different categories of genes that represent um, different arms of the interferon response or different aspects of, of antiviral defense. So for example, we looked at expression of Rig I and MDA5. Um, these are genes that code for uh, proteins that are present in the cytoplasm and act as sensor molecules for viral RNA. Um, and so for both of these genes, we saw this pattern where there was a, a more significant upregulation of each of these genes in the bronchus tissue from the infected CF pigs compared to the non-CFs. We saw a similar phenomenon when we looked at upregulation of IRF7. Um, so this is a, a transcription factor that is often activated during viral infection. Uh, again, we see a similar story with respect to upregulation of interferon beta and interferon lambda, as well as STAT1, which is a sig signal transduction molecule um, involved in uh, the interferon response. And we also looked at expression of a few different genes. So these are kind of interferon stimulated genes that uh, many of them could be thought of as sort of antiviral effector molecules. Uh, so they play different roles in sort of limiting viral replication in the cell in different ways. Um, in the case of IP10, this is a cytokine that has a signaling role during um, viral infection. And again, we see this same trend where there's a greater upregulation of each of these genes uh, in the infected CF pigs compared to the non-CFs. And this was, um, accompanied by uh, higher levels of viral RNA in the bronchus tissue from the uh, CF pigs compared to the non-CFs. Again, consistent with the idea that the viral, that the virus was sort of uh, replicating to higher levels in the, in the CF pigs airways compared to the non-CF pigs. So in conclusion, so far from our in, our in vivo studies, um, we do think that the influenza infection was greater in the airways of newborn CF pigs relative to non-CF litter mates, um, and this was reflected in uh, greater viral loads as indicated by titers, um, as well as increased viral antigen staining in the CF pigs, and also the CF pigs exhibited greater upregulation of innate immune and antiviral genes. And so overall, um, our our data so far suggests that newborn CF pigs do have an impairment in antiviral host defense. And I'll just sort of um, hammer home the point that because we're seeing this in newborn pigs, it suggests that this impairment in antiviral defense is likely to be a primary consequence of loss of CFTR function. So for future directions, um, one question that we're interested in is how much do inflammatory cells contribute to this difference? Uh, so we'd like to do some experiments to maybe ask whether inflammatory cells from CF pigs respond differently to viral or infectious stimuli. Um, we'd also like to look at the timing of the onset and resolution of inflammation during viral infection in the CF and non-CF pigs. And then additionally, we've thought about using uh, the CF pig as an animal model to test some different therapeutic interventions, and also as a model to kind of explore the relationship between respiratory viral infection and bacterial colonization and CF. And finally, um, I just need to end by acknowledging a large number of people who are part of our research group at the University of Iowa. Um, these animal experiments involve a lot of people and a lot of time and a lot of late nights. And so there are a lot of people that have really given their time to help make these studies happen. And so I need to thank them and acknowledge them. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Dr. Jay Coles. I'm the Director of Center for Translational Research and Infection Inflammation at Tulane School of Medicine. And the title of my talk today is Mechanisms of Microbial Persistence in CF. In terms of disclosures, I have grant support from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, I have no other disclosures. So my objectives today is to review the transcriptomic landscape of the CF airway, review pathogen-specific antibody responses in CF, and then uh, lastly, understand how IL-22-RA2, which encodes a protein called IL-22 binding protein, may contribute to microbial persistence in the CF airway. 
So we've known for years that uh, class two MHC is a gene modifier in, in CF. Um, and um, uh, this has been identified in several studies as well as in the gene modifier study, um, uh, which looked at uh, patients with uh, that were homozygous f 508 del uh, subjects. So what does class two MHC do? So class two presents is on antigen presenting cells and it presents antigen to CD4 cells. These CD4 cells uh, provide critical helper function um, to B cells. So B cells start as IgM producing B cells, but with CD4 help, um, they can undergo what's called class switch recombination, but where they convert to IgG producing uh, B cells. A subgroup of these B cells will also form plasma cells, um, which are long-term antibody secreting cells. But importantly, also B cells undergo a process called somatic hypermutation, where the B cell receptor mutates and increases its affinity to its antigen target, uh, which is a critical role for, um, um, for a B cell effector function. Um, now, in addition to this T helper function, T cells can also uh, become effector cells themselves. And there's three major effector cells in the lung, uh, Th2 cells, which are really critical for uh, worm infection or helmet infection, um, but they also provide B cell help because uh, IL-4 is a B cell growth factor. Uh, there's also Th1 cells, which are really critical for host defense against intracellular pathogens, such as mycobacterial species. And then there's Th17 cells, which are um, really critical for extracellular bacteria and fungal infection. So we wanted to know if there was any evidence for these uh, effector T cells in airway inflammation and cystic fibrosis. And one thing that's evolved in, in lung immunology over the last few years is this concept of tissue resident memory cells, cells that actually are in the lung parenchyma that don't circulate in blood. Um, so therefore sampling blood may not be very effective. So we wanted a strategy where we could sample the airway. Um, and these, these T cells are thought to live in the submucosa. So not, not very accessible by a bronchoscopy. However, they make cytokines that potentially could signal to the epithelium and therefore their footprint may be uh, present in the epithelium. And so we want to know what footprint to look for. So to generate footprints, we treated cells with interferon gamma or TH1, AL13 for TH2 and AL17 for TH17 uh, footprints. And you can see that when we treat with interferon gamma, there's a unique subset of genes that are upregulated by uh, that cytokine that's not really shared with AL13 or AL17. Likewise, when you treat with AL13, there's a unique subset of genes. And then when you treat with AL17, there's also a unique subset of genes. So now what happens if you look at the CF airway? So to do this, we enrolled a cohort of patients undergoing clinical bronchoscopy at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and performed RNA-seq on bronchial brushes. And what you can see is that during exacerbation, there's a strong TH1 signature in the epithelium of CF subjects. Uh, you also see this in severe asthma, not so much with mild asthma, and you don't see this in healthy controls. In contrast, the TH2 signature was really downregulated in CF. Uh, just to point out one gene here, periostin is an IL-13 biomarker, which is up in asthma, but downregulated in CF and not detectable in healthy controls. And then uh, there's also evidence for a strong TH17 signature uh, in the airway. So basically in this study, we, we found evidence for both a TH1 and TH17 type inflammation in the airway. But in contrast to asthma, um, in cystic fibrosis, we found actually T cell receptor genes in the mucosa, including both alpha, beta, and gamma delta T cells, suggesting that, that there's a more intense T cell inflammatory response in cystic fibrosis than even severe um, asthma. Moreover, we saw evidence of a B cell receptor signature. Um, one example here is this Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is the kinase that's downstream from B cell receptor signaling. We also saw evidence of all these immunoglobulin genes in the mucosa uh, and CF. So this raised the issue is, well, what are these antibodies doing? What are they reacting to? Um, and to study that, um, we amended the uh, protocol to include a, a bronchovial lavage where we could culture these and sort these B cells out of the uh, fluid and then look at, did they make Pseudomonas or Staph aureus a specific responses? And you can do this by um, 
sorting the as few as four B cells per well on a 96 well plate and allow them proliferate and they'll actually secrete enough antibody into the supernatant to test. And so this is just one example of a, a screen against Staph aureus. And so uh, each well has uh, four to 10 B cells from CF uh, bronchovial lavage. And you can see that if you look at uh, protein A, including Staph, almost all the wells light up because they protein A will just bind any IgG. But if you um, now take a protein A mutant, you can see uh, uh, evidence for uh, staph specific antibodies in a subgroup of these um, wells. Um, so we went in to clone these and sequence these antibodies uh, using Sanger sequencing. And then we looked at basically somatic hybrid mutation, how many rings are around the tree, how, how good are these B cells? And so what we're looking at is a cladogram, and we're looking at the branch length of the uh, um, light chain here. And uh, basically the longer the uh, branch length, the more mutations they have. So as a positive control, we included an anti-HIV antibody here that has uh, uh, is heavily somatically hypermutated. And many of the uh, clones that we identified in CF were close to germline with very little uh, somatic hypermutation, um, suggesting that maybe one mechanism of, of microbial persistence in the airway is basically a poor adaptive immune response, which actually may in part explain why class two MHC is a gene modifier um, in cystic fibrosis. Um, but the other gene we found in the airway is a gene related to this pathway, um, uh, IL-22. So IL-22 has been important in mucosal host defense uh, in the lung and in the GI tract. But this paper from Rachel McLaughlin at Trinity College in Dublin also showed that IL-22 functions in the upper airway to prevent staph colonization in the nasal mucosa. So, so as I mentioned, IL-22 can be made by T T817 cells. It can also be made by innate lymphoid cells uh, and perhaps NK cells. And its receptors on the epith respiratory epithelium or the GI tract, and IL-22 largely signals through STAT3, where it in can induce antimicrobial proteins as well as help with epithelial uh, repair. Now, IL-22 is regulated uh, through its binding to its receptor, but it's also regulated by a, a distinct gene called IL-22-RA2, which encodes a binding protein for IL-22, which can actually bind to hi with higher affinity then IL-22 to its receptor, and therefore sequester IL-22 and, um, and, and basically block IL-22 signaling. Um, and there's been very little human data on IL-22 RA2. So we were surprised when we looked at our CF RNA-seq data that IL-22 RA2 was highly expressed in the mucosa, suggesting that maybe this is one reason why, um, again, um, even though patients are making T cell responses to the pathogen, that these T cell responses are ineffective in clearing um, uh, their pathogen. So we, uh, we, we needed to develop a protein assay to, because we wanna know if this was upregulated at the protein level. And so we developed an ELISA assay. And you can see here, this is in nasal mucosal washes uh, that we did in collaboration with a cohort of patients undergoing CF um, uh, science procedures with Stella Lee at the uh, University of Pittsburgh and uh, with also help from uh, Jen Bomberger who was also looking at uh, microbial factors um, in, in this cohort. And we found very high levels of IL-22 binding protein. So here is each subject. And then this is di different measures at different visits for each subject. And you can see at many of the visits, um, the um, IL-22 binding protein levels in the nasal lavage fluid are well above uh, uh, 30 to 40 nanogram per mil here. And as a control, we looked at uh, non-CF uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, and we found reduced levels um, in this, uh, in these cohorts, which we did in collaboration with Bob Schleimer at Northwestern compared to CF. So it suggested that this was somewhat unique to CF, which fit the RNA-seq data because you don't see uh, upregulation of OSM2, RA2 in, uh, in, in the setting of um, asthma either. So uh, Christine Bojanowski, who leads our adult CF center here at Tulane, uh, wanted to know, could we detect this in the serum of, of patients? And you can see, again, here's a cohort of um, almost 30 subjects. And many of these patients have very high levels of IL-22 binding protein um, in the circulation. Um, so not only present in the nasal mucosa and um, um, 
in the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid, but also in the mucosa. So it's what's interesting is human IL-22 binding protein binds IL-22 much more avidly than mouse. So it's very difficult to use a mouse model to study this. So to overcome this limitation, we made a human IL-22 binding protein knock-in uh, transgenic um, uh, that overexpresses IL-22 binding protein. Um, and this is the serum levels in these mice. And, uh, um, and it comes close to uh, mimicking the serum levels that we see in cystic fibrosis patients. So now that with this mouse model in hand, we're looking at whether these mice have staph persistence um, uh, or even pseudomonas persistence in the uh, 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 upper airway or lower airway infection models. So to study staph persistence, we've also collaborated with um, the University of Chicago, who's made this strain called Wu-1, which they pu uh, uh, published that, that this can persist in uh, the, the nasal airway. And we replicated these data. So we inoculated mice with Staph aureus Newman strain or this Wu-1. And you can see that Staph aureus is cleared by day seven and Wu-1 persists way up, well out to day uh, uh, 30. Uh, this is confirmed by CFU, but also by um, real-time PCR with the Staph aureus target SA442. So to try to understand how we want us persisting uh, for so long, we did a uh, RNA-seq uh, study comparing Newman with uh, Wu-1. And um, this is the histology of these uh, animals after inoculation. You can see there's a, um, some uh, mucus in the airway in all these animals. And you can see that there's subtle airway inflammation here and maybe some evidence of uh, epithelial hyperplasia in mice uh, colonized with Staph aureus Newman. So we um, extracted RNA from the nasal mucosa and we did RNA-seq. And uh, what we saw in the um, uh, uh, Wu-1 colonized mice is that there was upregulation of some antimicrobial proteins such as uh, BPI, uh, family uh, eight, uh, member two, and lipokalon three, but there's a profound uh, reduction compared to Newman of many host defense genes, including myeloperoxidase, uh, the S100 uh, A8 uh, calgranulin proteins, uh, a defect in um, uh, uh, cathalicide antimicrobial protein, which is the mouse equivalent of L37, and also uh, a defect in mast cell proteases, which also may have a role in antimicrobial host defense. So it suggested that, um, that Wu1 was essentially a stealth pathogen by not inducing um, these molecules compared to Newman. Um, and uh, so uh, this may explain some of the uh, persistence of Wu1 in, uh, in the mouse nose. So if we do pathway analysis, the number one pathway that came up was uh, this antimicrobial peptide pathway, as well as uh, potassium channels in the, uh, uh, that were differentially regulated between Wu1 and uh, Staph Newman. So future directions, we want to identify the mechanisms of Wu1 persistence. In addition to the RNA-seq data, we're looking at the role of innate immunity versus adaptive immunity. We're using mouse genetic tools to do this, particularly uh, the, the use of RAG mice, which lack T cells and B cells, and then RAG2, IL-2 receptor gamma, double knockout mice, which lack um, T cells, B cells, NK cells, and innate lymphoid cells. Uh, we're determining if Staph aureus persists in these humanized IL-22 BP mice that we've made, and then we're also very interested in investigating the cellular sources of IL-22, RA2, and its upstream regulation in CF. There's data that, that um, uh, monocyte-derived macrophages and dendritic cells can uh, make IL-22, RA2, but there's very little known about the regulation of IL-22, RA2. And then um, Dr. Bojanowski, uh, as part of her Gilead Research Scholars Grant, is uh, uh, performing RNA scope on CF lung tissue to localize IL-22, RA2, uh, within the lung parenchyma. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that helped work that this uh, project was initiated in Pittsburgh at the Pittsburgh CF Center with Kong Chen and Mei Bo, Jen Bomberger and Stella Lee helped with uh, acquiring uh, nasal uh, samples. And then Joe Paluski uh, uh, ran the HBE core for the in vitro experiments. And then the Wu-1 strain came from um, University of Chicago, Dominic, uh, Siakis' lab. And then uh, this, this has been really spearheaded by Christine Bojanowski at our Tulane CF Center. And as I mentioned, she has a recent Gilead Scholar Grant to really understand um, 
the role of OS22 RE2 and can it really explain some of the microbial persistence uh, that we see both in the upper airway but also in the lower respiratory tract in patients with CF. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak about our interest in metabolic susceptibility to Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection and cystic fibrosis. I have no disclosures to report. So the learning objection, objectives for this presentation is to try to understand why CF patients get Pseudomonas aeruginosa and not other opportunistic pathogens. Why don't we see E. coli or Klebsiella, which are prevalent in the environment? Uh, and would get stuck in dehydrated thick mucus. A second question that is re relevant and related directly to the first is how do CFTR associated metabolites affect the initial colonization and selection for biofilm producing variants of Pseudomonas aeruginosa? What is the CF specific microenvironment? And also, it would be very interesting to understand if CFTR correctors and potentiators will affect susceptibility to infection by maybe changing this metabolic milieu. So to begin with, it's important to recognize that CF patients mainly get a few organisms, particularly early in life before there's a lot of lung damage. They get Staph aureus, they get Staph plus Pseudomonas and Pseudomonas. And this is very peculiar. Other diseases of um, ciliary dysmotility get lots of different organisms. So to begin with, I want to tell you what we're going to show you, which is that in the CF airway, there's an increased availability of a favorite metabolite, namely succinate, that enhances pseudomonas um, proliferation and actually helps it, um, drives the selection of variants of pseudomonas that are particularly adapted for the airway. The second major point I want to make is that the basis for this increased succinate is a decreased interaction of CFTR and the phosphatase P10 at membranes. P10 is a major regulator of cellular metabolism, and in the absence of sufficient P10, we see increased reactive oxygen species and increased succinate, and I'll show you that data. This affects inflammation in general, and it also affects um, the generation of another important metabolite that's a pseudomonas um, substrate, which is ataconate. And I want to explain that these two factors actually cause a CF microenvironment that drives adaptation of the bacterial pathogens. The increased reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial stress increases the bacterial production of extracellular polysaccharides and alginate and pseudomonas. And then this alginate drives ataconate production. And also these ataconate adapted organisms then make less LPS on their surface, changing their immunogenicity. So to begin with, it's important to recognize that succinate is elevated in CF bowel fluid. Here we see bowel fluid from he healthy controls versus CF patients, and you can see there's sub substantially um, much more succinate in CF. Uh, and this is true in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. To begin with, there's more succinate uh, released from peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And if you stimulate them with pseudomonas, there's an even greater increase. So pseudomonas has to adapt to this high succinate. Now, succinate is the preferred substrate for pseudomonas. If it had lots of different opportunities to eat different things, it would pick one at a time, and the one it would pick first is succinate. And that was well established by the microbiologists 30 years ago. And if you take a laboratory strain of Pseudomonas, such as PaO1, and you grow it in the presence of high succinate, it becomes mucoid. It makes lots of extracellular polysaccharide. And if you ask what genes are responsible for this shift in its metabolism, you can see in blue are the ones that were grown in high succinate. There's an increase in glucose metabolism. They actually suppress some of the succinate dehydrogenase enzymes. And there's an increase in the glyoxylate shunt at the level of transcription. So we wanted to know if that were the case um, for CF patients as well. So what we did is we compared the properties of the lab strain PAO1 that was grown in high succinate with a collection of CF isolates that Carmen Lozado got us from Spain 
uh, Paul Planet sequenced these isolates and we could look to see where there were variants that were developing and test the hypothesis that succinate was driving metabolic adaptation. And as you can see, there are lots of mutations that are accrued over the years um, uh, identified by whole genome sequencing, but these were basically clonal isolates and we had a small colony variant and a mucoid strain. And if you looked again at their metabolic genes and we use PAO1 as the control, you can see some significant upregulation of the glyoxylate shunt that puts um, carbon into the extracellular polysaccharides. And there's a major increase in glucose metabolism as well. So there is definitely a metabolic change in these organisms as they sit in the CF airway. So does this result in a different immune response? And it turns out that the CF strains really don't have the same kind of immune response as PAO1 or a wild type organism. They don't activate a lot of the pro-inflammatory signaling pathways. So to begin with, lipopolysaccharide that's displayed on the surface of Pseudomonas and other gram negatives interacts with TOL4, and this interaction activates uh, the release of mitochondrial succinate through the TCA cycle. Some of this leaks out into the cytoplasm, and succinate actually drives the um, expression of a transcription factor, HIF1-alpha. And HIF1-alpha is important in transcribing pro-IL-1 beta, which is one of the most important pro-inflammatory cytokines in the lung. Pro-IL-1 beta then has to be processed and released as IL-1 beta. This succinate in the cytoplasm of the cell will also leak out into the extracellular milieu. And if we look to see, does this happen in CF isolates versus controls, we're looking at the intracellular um, IL-1 beta that we find in either PAO1, and it's not there because with PAO1, it's processed and secreted. But with the CF isolates, we see intracellular um, IL-1 beta, and in fact, it does not get processed and released. And here's a, a graphical depiction showing you the amount of IL-1 beta in mice infected with either PAO1, where there's lots of succinate, or with the CF isolates, either the small colony variant, the mucoid strain, or all of them, 17 strains mixed up together. And in fact, if we looked at the succinate, wild-type pseudomonas stimulates lots of succinate, but these host-adapted strains stop stimulating succinate release. The host adapted strains then are better able to establish a chronic infection. If we put a standard dose of PAO1 into the mouse, the mice are all dead at two days. But if we put the exact same dose of the 17 CF strains, the mice persist for the organisms and the mice live for at least five days. And if we look at the colony forming units, uh, again, we can only measure PAO1 at the 24 hour time point, but the CF strains persist at a very high level, even up to five days following inoculation. So this change in the uh, metabolic activity of the organism is important in pathogenesis. So what is the metabolic uh, response to uh, succinate in, in the host? So to begin with, we, wa we want to know how, how are the macrophages in the lung stimulated? Normally, macrophages and uh, the alveolar macrophage population in the lung is relatively quiescent and they um, they do not produce a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Their phenotype is called the M2-like phenotype and uh, they use fatty acid uh, oxidation and they generate IL-13, uh, IL-4, but they're relatively quiescent. But in response to LPS, these quiescent M2-like macrophages become activated. They upregulate glycolysis. Glycolysis uh, provides substrates for the TCA cycle, and they generate succinate. And again, I showed you that succinate is very important in um, stimulating the whole pro-inflammatory pathway, getting us to NFKB activation and the production of IL-1 beta and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what are, where does the, cyto, the succinate come from? And are there other sources of succinate in CF besides just the macrophage? So one of the major regulators of cellular metabolism and the TCA cycle is P10. And P10 is the phosphatase and tensin homologue. It interacts with PIP3, phosphatidyl inositol PIP3 uh, at the cell membrane. And um, this regulates all of a lot of the cellular metabolic activity. So um, it, it lives in a complex with PI3 kinase. So you have a phosphatase and a kinase, and they will regulate the amount of PIP3 that's, that's turned into PIP2. 
PIP3 is attached to several other major important cellular regulators such as PDK1 and AKT, and this regulates cellular proliferation. And if you have adequate amounts of P10, you regulate uh, cellular metabolism through this pathway and cellular proliferation. Mutations in P10 are very common in malignancy, and it's one of the most important tumor suppressors that we have. Um, there are other consequences of P10 activity. The P10-PI3 kinase um, cascade regulates inflammatory signaling, and P10 can also have an anti-inflammatory effect through its effects on AKT. So Sebastian Raquelme in my lab showed that, C10 act, uh, that P10 actually forms a complex at the cell membrane with CFTR. And here's a computer model of this with the gray P10 interacting with C the C-terminus of CFTR. And if you go to his paper in immunity, he'll show you in some detail how this interaction unfolds. Now, this is significant because if you look at normal patients and you ask how much CFTR is in the cell and how much P10 is in the cell, normal controls are up in this upper right-hand quadrant. And all the gray boxes are normal healthy controls. The blue um, uh, boxes and triangles are CF patients, mostly with the Delta 508, 508 mutation, who are on therapy. And you notice that they have just as much P10 and CFTR as the normal controls do. However, CF patients with other mutations or those not on therapy don't have as much uh, CFTR at the membrane where it interacts with P10. And they fall into this group here where there's less CFTR and less P10. Now, how important is that? Well, it also affects um, uh, several things in the cell, including immune signaling. So if we look at the different types of CFTR mutations and ask how much P10 is there, here's the P10 dimer that's active. Over on the left side of here are normal controls and here are the CF mutations. And you can see here's the, um, the P110 delta component of PI3 kinase is decreased, phospho-AKT is decreased, and TRAP, an important adapter for NFKB signaling, that is also decreased in this, with the CF mutations. And here's showing you that there's less CFTR. So what happens in the absence of P10, we have less of this complex is formed and we lose the breaks on NFKD activation. Now, the lack of P10 also results in the increased secretion of succinate. Um, as part of its function in controlling cellular metabolism. So here's a cell line lacking P10, and P10 is an essential um, gene, and uh, so you can have a cell line, but not an entire uh, organism or mouse lacking totally P10. And you can see in this cell line, to begin with, if you're lacking P10, you have somewhat more succinate secreted, and if I stimulate this cell line with pseudomonas, I get an even greater release of succinate. Now, mice can uh, have a, a, an isoform of P10 called P10 long that diminishes the total amount of P10 by about 20 to 30 percent, particularly in the macrophage population. So we studied P10 long null mice, and what we found was in the P10 long mice that are lacking only about 30 percent of P10, the baseline amount of succinate and bowel fluid in these mice was the same. If we infected the mice with Pseudomonas aeruginosa PAO1, we got the expected increase in succinate, as I showed you that succinate is an important part of the inflammatory response. But we got a significantly higher release of succinate in uh, infected uh, P10 long null mice, indicating that this is likely an important part of the P10 CFTR axis. So P another component with cellular metabolism and proliferation is that P10 regulates the generation of oxidants. And here's Sebastian, rarely seen relaxing like this, um, measured oxidant stress in the P10 uh, nell cell lines. And you can see the red is the increased amount of, um, of oxidant stress that we measured in those, um, in those cell lines. And here's the fold increase in mitochondrial oxidants. And the gene that makes Itaconate, IRG1, is also increased in the P10 null cell lines. And we'll come back to itaconate because that becomes very important as well. And you can see here, in the absence of P10, we have significantly more P, um, IRG1 expression. 
So what happens is we have in CF, we have host adapted strains. They first eat a lot of succinate, but then they stop generating succinate because it's too stressful. It's associated with too much metabolism and too much reactive oxygen species generation. And the host activates the expression of IRG1 in response to infection to produce ataconate. And ataconate is very anti-inflammatory. It suppresses the NLRP3 inflammasome. It suppresses succinate dehydrogenase, and it suppresses uh, interferon production. So if we look at um, the amount of, of IRG1 that's expressed in monocytes in bowel fluid, if we take mice infected with PAO1, not so much. But if we infect the mice with all 17 CF strains, we have a major increase in IRG1 expression in these monocytes that we're recovering from infected mice. And then if we measure the ataconate that we find in bowel fluid, again, PAO1 doesn't, have so, doesn't stimulate so much ataconate, but the CF strains stimulate a huge amount of ataconate. And if you go back to CF sputum, you find that there's much, much more ataconate in CF sputum than there is in that in normal controls. And that parallels in some ways the amount of succinate that we find in the CF sputum as well. So the organisms are producing ataconate and Pseudomonas is able to metabolize ataconate. So here are the different properties of, of ataconate. It's activated by LPS stimulation. Um, it is generated from uh, cisaconitase. Uh, it acts to suppress, as I said, uh, succinate dehydrogenase, blocks the inflammasome, and is highly anti-inflammatory. So what do CF strains do in response to this milieu? So there are three genes important in the metabolism of ataconate, uh, and they're depicted here on the x-axis. And if you look at ICU isolates of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, there's not so much upregulation of these um, of these genes that degrade ataconate. But in CF subjects, you see there's a huge upregulation of the of the genes. And we just looked at two different CF isolates here from two different patients. So you can see that there's a response by these organisms that have become host adapted. And Pseudomonas then these adapted strains preferentially eat ataconate and metabolize it, they, they break it down to pyruvate. And if we look at the CF strains, we notice that if you put them in a mouse that's not able to produce um, ataconate, the IRG1 null mouse, they're much, much less able to persist in the airways. But if you look at PAO1 that has not yet become acclimatized to ataconate, that um, infects just the IRG1 null mice just fine. And then if we look at other effects of ataconate on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we notice that if you grow on PAO1 in glucose plus ataconate, so glucose is the control, when you add ataconate, you have a substantial decrease in LPS biosynthesis and transporter genes. Whereas you have uh, at the same time an increase in the alginate producing genes and in the genes that are involved in the biosynthesis of extracellular polysaccharides and their transport to the cell surface. And this includes PEL and PSL. And then if we look at the strains of Pseudomonas that are grown in the presence of the taconate uh, and look at their LPS, here's E. coli as a control, here's Pseudomonas grown in glucose, and here's Pseudomonas with glucose plus ataconate. We have a major change in the LPS uh, of Pseudomonas grown in the presence of ataconate. All of these O side chains are gone. So what cells actually make ataconate? It turns out that it's this is single cell RNA-seq data. Here's the PBS control. It's predominantly uh, the neutrophil population and some of the monocytes. And it's basically the same in both um, PAO1 and with the CF isolates. So to wrap this up, when we want to ask the question, why do CF patients get pseudomonas and not other opportunistic pathogens, um, it's important to recognize that inflammation just by itself generates succinate and pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is significantly, this process is significantly increased in the absence of sufficient P10. It needs CFTR to properly tether it to the membrane so it functions normally. And without CFTR, it doesn't function well. 
The second question was how do CFTR associated metabolites affect colonization and biofilm? I just showed you that Pseudomonas likes succinate, so that's the initial colonization. They adapt to the metabolic stress of, of proliferating so much, and then they start to consume the abundant ataconate that's generated by the host. And then they stop producing so much LPS, and they shunt their uh, metabolites into the formation of biofilm. And the last question was, will all the CFTR modulators change susceptibility to Pseudomonas? And um, our data would suggest that by increasing CFTR um, presence on membranes, you're going to increase P10, and that should correct the immunometabolic abnormality in CF. And I just wanted to call attention to the people that did most of the work. Most of the papers I cited were from Sebastian Raquelme. Emily Domango provided the patient material. Kira Tomlinson did the single cell RNA-seq analysis. Paul and Ahmed did the uh, genomic studies of the CF isolates. And Clemente Brito provided us with many clinical samples. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Hunter. I'm an Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Minnesota. And to begin, I'd like to thank the organizers, Dr. Kudrowski, Dr. Fisher for the uh, invitation to speak here, but also the CF Foundation for putting on this meeting. Of course, I would have rather seen all of you in person about a month ago, uh, but, of, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm appreciative of this opportunity nonetheless. These are my disclosures. And today I've been charged with providing an overview of the role, or at least potential role, of anaerobic bacteria in, C in CF airway disease. I think it's now broadly appreciated that these less frequently studied microbes are both prevalent and at times abundant in the CF airways, but their mechanistic roles in disease pathophysiology, either positive or negative, are poorly understood and also underappreciated in terms of how these bacteria may be critical players in the onset progression and management of infection. And so today, my goal is to provide an overview of what's known about CF anaerobic microbiology, their interactions with one another, the host, and perhaps more canonical pathogens, and then address the question of whether or not we should be treating these organisms therapeutically, or conversely, stimulating their growth to promote stability among airway bacterial communities. For the majority of the 80 years since the initial description of CF, respiratory microbiologists have traditionally focused on a narrow range of aerobic pathogens recognized for their ability to cause human infection and their association with worse clinical outcomes. These include Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenzae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and even newer emerging pathogens such as Acromobacter, Stenotrophomonas, and non-tuberculosis mycobacterium, though it's not shown on the chart here. As a result, these pathogens, which are routinely detected by culture-based methods in the laboratory setting, are those that have historically been targeted by antibiotic treatment regimens in the clinic. But thanks to the advent of extended culture-based methods and even newer culture-independent molecular approaches, we now appreciate that the vast, the vast majority of lower and even upper airway infections harbor complex and dynamic bacterial communities, exemplified by this individual who was profiled over time. And we're now at a point where we appreciate the majority of CF sinus and lung infections are polymicrobial manifestations of the disease. Many of these bacterial genera, which are not detected clinically, are either strict or facultative anaerobes that are more classically known as keystone members of our oral or supraglottic microbiota. These include Bionella, Prevotella, Fusobacterium, Streptococcus, and to a lesser extent, representative genera shown here on the right. Bob Dixon's group at Michigan has done a lot of nice work in this space showing that even in the healthy airways, which are not sterile as once believed, Oral flora is microaspirated into the lower airways, and from an early age, airway bacterial communities are shaped by a balance between immigration from the upper airways, colonization, and elimination of specific members of those microbial communities. Importantly, in CF, that last point, elimination, is restricted due to the CFTR mutation, immune dysfunction, and mucociliary impairment. And so this group of organisms, which are classically regarded as commensal members of the oral cavity, comprise potentially important members of the CF lung microbiome as well. And this was first recognized in the 1990s by Jews and Spencer, who used anaerobic bacterial culture on expectorated sputum. They found the majority of subjects in their cohort harbored bacteroides species, which now includes Prevotella, anaerobic gram-positive cocci, and also Vianella. A decade and a half later, um, one of the first studies to uh, address community complexity using a molecular approach was by Rogers et al. who used terminal restrict restriction fragment length polymorphism analysis to characterize the diversity of bacterial communities in 71 sputum samples. In doing so, they identified the mean number of these bands that you see here on the left-hand side, each one of which represents a specific bacterial species, 
averaged about 13 to 14 per patient. But they also showed that among these bands, eight of them were consistent with the presence of an anaerobic genus, including Prevotella, Rothia, Streptococcus, and Bionella. And of course, these seminal studies paved the way for the now extensive body of literature describing the use of 16S RNA sequencing to show that airway communities are complex and dynamic, vary across the spectrum of disease severity, multiple age groups, sample type, and disease state. And this is also supported by new culturomic-based approaches by Michael Tunney, Michael Surratt, and other colleagues that have shown that viable and robust populations of anaerobes are not only present within the CF lung, but are often found at cell densities comparable to those of traditional pathogens. But despite this emerging evidence of the polymicrobial basis of disease, the specific roles of anaerobic bacteria and disease progression are currently not well understood. Complicating the issue is that both observational studies and reductionist in vitro experiments exploring mechanistic hypotheses about how anaerobes impact lung disease provide seemingly contradictory results about whether oral flora contribute to lung pathology or are simply commensals with negligible clinical impact. Take, for example, this work by Edith Zamanek et al., who used pyrosequencing uh, to study sputum micro microbiota at early exacerbation, and they found that relative to samples uh, that were dominated by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, in this top row here, anaerobe abundance was positive, positively correlated with reduced inflammation, as measured by sputum neutrophil elastase and serum C-reactive protein, but also increased or improved lung function as determined by FV1. Similarly, O'Neill used extended culture methods to show an inverse relationship between strict anaerobe colony counts and lung function as determined by spirometry. And here I'm showing total viable count of Vianella uh, relative to FEV1. Bernardi and colleagues used 16SRNA sequencing and ordination plots to demonstrate that the F1 axis, which explained 35% of variance in the data, was positively correlated with not only FEV1, but also Peptostreptococcus, Prevotella, Porphyromonas, Rothia, Streptococcus, and Fusobacterium, which I'm showing uh, circled in red here. But importantly, these variables strongly and positively correlated with each other, suggesting that these bacterial taxa may play a beneficial role. George O'Toole's group used 16S to show that the facultative anaerobes Streptococcus and Gamella were most associated with clinically stable disease, or at least um, uh, disease in outpatients relative to inpatients. And then more recently, Marianne Mühlbach et al. Uh, applied extended culture methods to sputum and BAL and identified age-related prevalence rates of anaerobes and relationships between clinical outcomes. And while they only considered strict anaerobes in this study, the results were nevertheless consistent with previous work showing that anaerobes were positively associated with markers of milder CF disease, including better lung function, BMI, and pancreatic sufficiency. And so collectively, while these observations don't necessarily rule out a pathogenic role altogether, these data may certainly suggest that anaerobes are either beneficial, and I'll touch on this towards the end of my presentation, or just innocent bystanders that contribute little to disease pathogenesis. Yet interestingly, other studies tell a different story and suggest that anaerobes, at least in some patients when monitored over time, are actually detrimental. For example, John LaPuma's group, who used 16S sequencing to profile 111 uh, subjects over 10 years, found that both bacterial community diversity and the relative abundance of anaerobes increased during exacerbation of symptoms prior to antibiotic treatment, but then decreased during therapy. Although they note that these trends were not consistent uh, or not observed uniformly across all subjects, particularly in those with more uh, advanced disease states. And in a previous paper by the same group, they reported that the relative abundance of gamella, uh, which is shown here in panel A, uh, increased in 24 out of 29 samples at exacerbation, and in fact was found to be the most discriminative genus between baseline and exacerbation status in this particular patient cohort. And then finally, more recently, Rob Quinn, then at San Diego State, but now at, at Michigan State, developed the WinCF model. So this is an in vitro culture system that can recapitulate airway bacterial communities on the lab bench. And using this approach, uh, he monitored an individual patient over time through two exacerbation episodes. And not only did he observe a decrease in pH and increase in gas bubbles, uh, immediately prior to an exacerbation episode, and these are two diagnostic features of anaerobic fermentative metabolism, but that these two in vitro observations were reversed in samples obtained from that same patient immediately upon treatment with antibiotics. And that's what's shown with these black arrows here. And so these data support a causal effect of mixed acid fermentation in acute disease flares. So as I noted, seemingly contra uh, contradictory and controversial results, even among observational studies, would suggest both beneficial and detrimental roles. 
And this discordance certainly warrants further in vitro mechanistic experiments to probe the potential pathogenic or even commensal mechanisms of this enigmatic group of organisms. So what are these potential mechanisms? The first is virulence, or the direct pathogenic effect on the host through either virulence factors or metabolites they produce. Like many aerobic pathogens, anaerobes are also known to produce virulence factors, even though they're thought of as benign and commensal bacteria of the oral cavity that prote protect against invading pathogens. In fact, trafficking of anaerobes to other body sites, including the gut, soft tissue, or wound infections, can actually be detrimental as a result of their virulence repertoire and metabolic byproducts. And so there's reason to believe that if they're found in abundance in the lower airways, they may also play a pathogenic role. So for example, Prevotella intermedia and Prevotella nigrosens produce proteolytic and hydrolytic enzymes, which even in the oral cavity can break down connective tissue and host defense mechanisms, leaving the host susceptible to infection. One specific example is interparent A production by Prevotella intermedia. So this is a cysteine protease that has been shown to inhibit complement by degrading C1 and C3 and affecting the consequent downstream anti-inflammatory cascade. Similarly, Prevotella, Vianella, Fusobacterium, and Streptococcus through their fermentative metabolisms produce short-chain fatty acids, including propionate, butyrate, and acetate, which have all been measured in abundance in CF sputum and are pro-inflammatory. Notable work by Mirkovic and colleagues have shown that acetate in particular drives excessive release of IL-8 from CF, CF epithelial cells, which is an important meter of neutrophil recruitment. They also showed that this release is mediated by a specific um, uh, membrane receptor, GPR41, on the surface of uh, CF cells compared to non-CF controls. And then complementary work by Gorbani and colleagues showed that an inflammatory effect of these metabolites um, on host epithelia uh, included uh, overproduction of nitric oxide in response to anaerobe challenge. Anaerobes may also exert their influence through interactions with co-colonizing microbiota. In fact, a number of studies have recently shown that the presence of specific anaerobic species can potentiate the virulence of recognized pathogens. Work from my own group showed that when growing on mucus as a sole carbon source, um, degradation or anaerobe degradation and fermentation of mucin glycans liberates metabolites, including short chain fatty acids and small peptides that stimulate not only an order of magnitude increase in pseudomonas growth, but also the expression of a suite of virulence genes, including pyocyanin, the product of, product of which is shown here on the right-hand side in these tubes. Other fermentation byproducts such as 2,3 butane dione, which is produced by anaerobes and found in high abundance in exhaled breath condensate, have been shown to increase virulence expression and biofilm formation in Pseudomonas aeruginosa as well. Although it's not shown on this slide, Prevotella species are also known to produce autoinducer 2, which is an intracellular signaling molecule. Not only can Pseudomonas aeruginosa use AI2 as a carbon source, but this small molecule has also been shown to modulate the expression of virulence genes in Pseudomonas in trans, including elastase, exotoxin, and phenazine biosynthesis genes, which may suggest that Prevotella contributes to Pseudomonas pathogenesis when co-colonizing the lung. Other groups have shown or used in vivo murine infection models to show that co-infection of Pseudomonas with Vianella parvula not only resulted in greater pathogen load relative to mono-infection, but a greater deterioration of the host as shown here, suggesting that complex interactions between co-infecting organisms are a greater determinant of clinical outcomes relative to individual pathogens on their own. Like most pathogens in the lung, antibiotic resistance can also be problematic among anaerobic isolates. Prevotella, for example, is one of the most common anaerobes isolated from CF samples, and many species are known to secrete beta-lactamases, which enzymatically cleave penicillins and their derivatives. And Field and colleagues demonstrated that 100% of Prevotella melaninogenica and 75% of Prevotella histocola from adults produce these enzymes, and not only will these enzymes confer self-protection to the producing strain, but since they're secreted out into the extracellular milieu, they can effectively reduce antibiotic concentrations in their local environment, such that co-colonizing organisms nearby could survive. And this was shown by Sherard et al., who demonstrated that Prevotella-driven cross-protection of Pseudomonas against ceftazidine treatment in vitro. I also note that fermentative activity by anaerobes can drastically lower sputum pH, which has been shown by Dan Newman's group, and this not only leads to higher minimum inhibitory concentrations of several antibiotics, include, including ciprofloxacin and tobramycin, but low pH can also impact the activity or efficacy of antimicrobial peptides that are present in the airway surface liquid, such as beta defensins or LL37. Speaking of anaerobic coverage, Lindsay Caverly's group recently performed a retrospective single center study of individuals treated with intravenous antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbations. Given their previous observation that an increase in anaerobic activity was associated with the onset of exacerbation prior to therapy, 
they thought to test they sought to test their hypothesis that exacerbations treated with antibiotics with anaerobic activity would improve outcomes compared to anti antibiotics without. So IV antibiotics were classified as either broad or minimal anaerobic coverage, as shown on the left. And exacerbations treated with broad coverage were propensity score matched to those treated with minimal anaerobic coverage. The primary outcome, which was the percent of baseline percent FEV1 recovered, was compared between antibiotic categories with a linear mixed model. And the secondary outcome, the time to the next pulmonary exacerbation was also assessed. So in this study, 514 exacerbations for 182 individuals were included, but in the matched exacerbation samples, Broad coverage was neither a significant predictor of FE1 recovered, nor was it a significant predictor uh, of time to next exacerbation as shown here. And so while targeted treatment of specific anaerobes in the context of acute disease flares remains a potential therapy, what these data show is that broad anaerobic coverage does not necessarily confer an additional benefit for routine exacerbation therapy. So I'm not sure I've answered the question of whether anaerobes are friend or foe, but I also don't think these seemingly controversial observations are mutually exclusive. In fact, one can envision a scenario in which a given anaerobe or community of anaerobes, even if they're associated with milder, milder disease, can still impact the physiology and virulence of a canonical pathogen once it reaches dominance, but yet only specific members of that community might respond to a given antibiotic therapy. If anything, I propose that these data motivate further study of, of their mechanistic contributions to disease and whether we can exploit their interactions with one another, the host and other pathogens as a new approach to disease management. So where do we go from here? There are obviously inherent challenges associated with studying anaerobes, but I think the path forward can be made easier by addressing two key limitations. And the first is the development of new tools and model systems. Not everything is conveniently aerobic, uh, nor are anaerobes compatible with many animal models. And so coming up with accessible, affordable, and versatile model systems that accurately recapitulate the in vivo milieu will be a critical next step. Along these lines, I'd like to refer you to a recent opinion piece by George O'Toole and 33 other colleagues that recently convened a two-day workshop funded by the CF Foundation focused on future directions of model systems for the study of polymicrobial CF infections. And this piece nicely summarizes the outcomes of that workshop. Not to steal his thunder, uh, but I'd also like to refer you to my postdoc, Patrick Moore's poster, oral presentation, and preprint, in which he describes a dual oxic anoxic system that enables co culture of anaerobic bacteria and host epithelial cells despite their conflicting oxygen demands. Using this system, he has shown that not only do anaerobes uh, elicit a pro inflammatory phenotype, but they also facilitate increased colonization of the epithelial surface through modification and degradation of the apical mucus layer. My second point is moving beyond the reductive approach of treating all anaerobes as a whole. Just as canonical pathogens show genus, species, and even strain-specific differences in virulence, transmissibility, and antibiotic tolerance, it's highly likely that select anaerobic isolates are more likely to cause harm than others. And just to illustrate this point, I'll show some recent data from my former graduate uh, student, Sarah Lucas, who cultivated and enriched anaerobic communities from the upper airways from individuals with chronic sinus disease. And this is not CF, but it's still relevant as the majority of subjects suffer from upper airway infection. So after enrichment of eight unique bacterial communities, she um, took Staphylococcus aureus, another canonical pathogen, and grew this pathogen on spent supernatants from the enriched community communities to determine how co-colonizing microbiota might affect the physiology of staph within the airways. And while we found consistency in gene expression patterns between anaerobic communities, including sialic acid metabolism and central metabolic pathways involved in acetate and succinate metabolism or succinate utilization, we also found striking differences between communities. So shown here, staph grown in supernatant of community H shows increased expression of the AGR regulon Staphopane B, immunodominant antigen B, delta hemolysin, and a repressor of the IK, IK, uh, ICA adhesion gene. So these are all well-known virulence pathways in Staph aureus. When grown in different supernatants, Staph showed increased expression of the IK adhesion genes and also the holin protein side A, both of which are recognized to be involved in biofilm formation. And finally, one of the reasons staph is such an effective pathogen is its ability to assume metabolic states that are resistant to stress and nutrient limitations seen at sites of infection. And across supernatants D and F, you see increased expressions of gene involved in lactate and galactose utilization, oligopeptide transport, methionine biosynthesis, sulfate starvation, and branch chain amino acid synthesis, which are all associated with, with a metabolic state that's resistant to nitrosative stress. And while we've not yet identified the specific players or individual communi 
community members that are driving differences in staph gene expression, it's becoming abundantly clear through these and other studies that the physiology and gene expression of a given pathogen in vivo is highly dependent on the specific composition of its co-colonizing microbiota and the metabolites that they're exchanging. As a final point, I just uh, want to close by highlighting a recent study by Orly Crabay's group, which may have identified a bacterium with potentially anti-inflammatory properties in the airway. Using in vitro 3D co-culture, in contrast to pseudomonas, which elicits a pro-inflammatory response, and that's shown by IL-8 expression seen here, Rothia mucilaginosa has little effect. However, not only is it anti-inflammatory, but when co-cultured with pseudomonas at the respiratory or at the epithelial uh, interface, it has an inhibitory effect on the pro-inflammatory effect of the pathogen. Similarly, in a murine model of infection, Rothia challenge was sufficient to reduce the inflammatory properties of lipopolysaccharide. And then in a cohort of adults with bronchiectasis, the abundance of Rothia mucilaginosa was significantly negatively correlated with inflammatory markers IL-8 and also matrix metalloproteases and sputum. They ultimately determined that this effect was mediated by the inhibition of the NF-kappa B pathway and consequently the expression of its downstream target genes. I highly encourage you to check this paper out because to my knowledge, this is the first description of a mechanistic beneficial role of oral microbiota in the CF airways. And I think further reductionist studies such as this one showing a direct effect of individual anaerobic taxa on the host and co-colonizing organisms will be critical for our understanding and management of disease. And so I'll close there. Very clearly, the role of anaerobes in disease pathophysiology is complex, but the fact that taxonomic studies using emerging omics technologies are now being complemented with reductionist experiments testing mechanistic hypotheses about their functional roles is an important step in the right direction towards developing treatment strategies that address mechanisms of infection, not only in primary pathogens, but their anaerobic co-colonizers as well. Thanks for listening. Good morning and welcome to everybody who's tuned in for our symposium today. Um, we are the symposium number 26 on host pathogen interactions in CF. Um, I am one of your session co-chairs, Megan Kudrowski from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, I'm joined by my co-chair, Tony Fisher at the University of Iowa. Hello. Um, and we would like to say thank you so much to all of our great speakers today for taking the time to record their talks. Um, and they're here today for a live question and answer session that we'll get started with now. Um, before we get going into it, I just wanted to go over some of the objectives we had going into this session, um, because there's a lot of interest in CF in general around infections and how pathogens play a role in, in um, decline and disease over the years in, in CF populations. But really, we need to think of it as a more complex um, cohesive picture with host interactions and how that also interplays with the different pathogens that we see. Um, so some of the learning objectives we had coming into today's session were to discuss factors that make the CF airways susceptible to different types of pathogens, um, as wide of a range as we could get in today, viruses, different types of bacteria, um, including anaerobes and some others that um, we don't always think about. Um, and also, how do microbes adapt to the CF mucosal environment, and how does this influence virulence um, or other phenotypes that we observe? And then also we wanted to include a discussion of some of the different types of antimicrobial host defenses in CF um, and potentially what defects there are and how this plays into pathogen responses. Um, so I just wanted to welcome again our, our four speakers that we had today. So we had Jenny Bartlett from the University of Iowa. We had Jay Coles from Tulane University, Alice Prince from Columbia University, and Ryan Hunter from the University of Minnesota. So I think we had some great questions in the chat that we can get started with. Um, Tony, I don't know if you want to take the first one. Yeah. So um, let's uh, let's go back to the uh, to the first talk with uh, Dr. Bartlett. Um, you know, one thing that was very interesting is is that you showed um, these uh, uh, differences in antiviral effect between CF and non-CF for for different viruses, um, and viruses are quite diverse. Uh, we have Vi uh, encapsulated viruses like adenovirus or rhinovirus, and we have um, membrane-bound uh, envelope viruses like sendavirus, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, other other viruses that that we think about, and yeah. and so um, you know you showed that that this defense against viruses is protein dependent um, by um, heat inactivation. 
Um, but it, uh, is it possible that there are, are many different antiviral factors and, and how do you figure out how many of them there are and which, which ones contribute? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, so yes, it's definitely possible. Um, you know, it's possible that there are metabolites um, that are in the present in the airways that could be affecting these results. Um, you know, there's, it, it, it's hard to answer because we don't really know. We haven't been able to really uh, pinpoint what really the mechanism is yet that's contributing to this phenotype. And there's, you know, certainly a number of different possibilities. Um, I will say that I think um, up front, I think that this is most likely um, a multifactorial um, phenomenon. So it's probably not just one thing that's causing this. Um, but, you know, you could imagine that there are problems uh, with the functions of inflammatory cells. Um, so there could be, you know, issues. We know that um, in humans, that human CF macrophages are um, hyperinflammatory and they have defects in their ability to um, opsonize and take up uh, infected cells and uh, bacterial and viral products. So you could imagine that in the context of a, a viral infection, there could be defects in the ability of of the, the macrophages and the neutrophils that are being called in or the tissue resident alveolar macrophages in their, um, as far as the, the pro-inflammatory cytokines that they're releasing, they may be releasing, um, you know, there may be high production of um, inflammatory cytokines or um, interferons. And so that could be contributing to this phenotype. Um, we also know that there are defective properties of the mucus in these animals that are present that are present at birth. Um, so the the mucus is sticky and more viscous, um, and this does have the effect of hindering mucociliary clearance. So you could imagine that um, you could have reduced um, clearance in the airways of these animals. So when there's a inhaled virus, that virus is going to have an increased residence time and possibly an increased possibility of infecting. Um, there could also be pH effects, um, as we talked about. So we know that uh, the pH of the airway surface liquid in these animals is relatively low. And so this could be something that could affect the functioning of secreted antimicrobials. So there we'd be looking at, at proteins. Um, we also know that uh, many respiratory viruses, their uh, their interactions with their receptors are pH dependent. Um, we also know, it, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, that uh, there could be issues with proteases, um, so altered protease and antiprotease balance. Um, you know, so if you have overactive proteases, um, that could be affecting the functioning of secreted antimicrobials. Um, you know, so there could be a lot of things going on here, basically, and it's probably not all um, one thing. Um, and, you know, we're, it's, it's going to take a while to sort through all of this. Um, but yes, I, I, that's a great point. It, it's probably, it, it's possible that it's not all just uh, proteins. Yeah, I think this relates a lot to one of the other questions that we're seeing in the chat. Um, uh, and relating back to the pH of the airway secretions. And have you tried buffering or normalizing the pH um, in the <laughs> airway secretions? And does this correct any of the antiviral yeah. activity? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, because when we started on this, you know, we previously had a body of work from our research groups showing that um, there is defective anti antibacterial killing in the, the surface liquid from these animals. And if you restore the pH of the CF secretions to a more non-CF level that you can completely restore their antibacterial activity. So um, going into this, we um, hypothesize that the same might be true um, with respect to antiviral activity. We have tried that. And what we find is that we see kind of a, a partial restoration of antiviral activity. So the CF secretions do, uh, they start to look a little bit more like the non-CFs, but it's not a total um, recovery of the activity, which is interesting. So it, it suggests to us that there's something, it's not all pH mediated, uh, but maybe it's partially pH mediated. Um, and it suggests that the, the way that uh, the mechanisms of sort of um, fighting viruses and bacteria are different in the airways. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. 
Yeah, I'm not sure this is a wild card question because um, this is a very different type of virus and I'm, I don't know the answer myself, but I wonder the effect of pH on bacteriophage and if any of the bacteriologists out there have thoughts, um, if that would also change that type of activity, that's another group of viruses that we're really seeing a lot of interest in, in CF. And I'm not sure if that does alter um, phage activity, excision, maybe more stress on bacteria leading to more excision of phage, but um, that would be another interesting thing to think about in the context of viruses. Yeah, definitely. I think it could certainly impact the initial attachment of phage, phage to receptors on the surface. You might have a pH mm -hmm. effect there. Yeah, sometimes we don't know whether to think about phage as a virus or as a, <laughs> as a bacterial related component. So let's see, what else are we finding? I, I'm a, I have a question for uh, Dr. Coles. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that the uh, uh, T cell populations that, um, that you identified are very close to germline. Does this suggest that the uh, uh, the microorganisms that are stimulating them are, are doing it in a, in a very nonspecific way? Well, it's actually, the, it's the B cell. So the, so B cell um, class switch recombination and, oh. and, and, and somatic hypermutation is regulated by an enzyme called cytosine deaminase uh, okay. that's tightly controlled in B cells. And I didn't have time to put it, but it's actually that, that ex expression is very low in the RNA-seq data compared to like CD19 or other B-cell molecules. Um, you know, what, what actually regulates cytosine deaminase is a little bit unclear. Um, but um, yeah, so what we're doing now is actually, you know, that, that that data is somewhat biased, right? Because I was getting, we were getting data from patients undergoing exacerbation. And what we've now done with the CFFT is, is, is look at um, um, samples from the gene modifier study, archived serum samples, um, to look at, at antibody responses in serum, um, you know, that we don't have enough lung samples, but, but basically, uh, kind of this concept of a long-term non-progressor cohort. So patients with FIOA DEL that have had at least two sputum cultures positive for pseudomonas, but have essentially normal lung function at age 18. And what's interesting is the preliminary data looks like they have a higher amount of IgG4 against pseudomonas, which is a, basically a regulatory antibody. Uh, doesn't activate complement, whereas the patients with poor lung function have tend to have more IgG3 responses, which which activate complement. So, um, so we're we're doing a, we're doing that now in a validation cohort to see if that holds up um, in two independent you know cohorts of patients. Um, but I think you know there, there's a lot you know we need to learn a lot. I mean, coming back to Jennifer's talk too, is is I was wondering whether you know, the first GWAS study in COVID implicated CXR6, which is the chemokine receptor in TR tissue resident memory cells. So I, I, it made us think, you know, well, just do CF patients, even with, with a pseudomonas specific TRM cell, um, particularly a TH1 cell that's making interferon, give you a kind of a non-specific enhanced antiviral immunity, you know, against a, 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 a virus like COVID. Um, so how the adaptive immune response kicks in over time you know, in adult subjects with CF and how they handle viruses. So my, my guess is that how hosts handle viruses will be, will change greatly, you know, as they uh, go from newborns to infants to adults with CF. There were some methodologic questions uh, uh, that pertain to your study as well. Um, were these uh, BAL studies from children, uh, adults? Uh, what, what were the uh, relevant microorganisms that the patients were positive for? Yeah, so, so uh, most were pediatric samples. We did do some B cells from uh, patients undergoing lung transplantation. Um, obviously, the patients undergoing lung transplantation had a higher rate of aspergillus colonization. Um, but we only focused our screen to detect pseudomonas and staph specific cells. We did not have a screen set up to look at aspergillus specific um, responses. And then pseudomonas and staph were the two dominant pathogens in the pediatric cohort. But, but basically, we follow the lessons from the HIV community. So the HIV community developed this whole, you know, B-cell culture system to find, um, essentially, they, they were looking at patients got HIV infected, but didn't progress to AIDS. And mm -hmm. so they, they cloned these B-cells, and they found that these, um, uh, some of these patients had really highly avid um, uh, anti-GP120 uh, uh, antibodies that were neutralizing against multiple clades of HIV. 
Yeah, I think that kind of addresses another question that was in the chat as well about knowing the culture results um, from the bell and the history. So it's just another one of those factors that becomes such a confounder when we're trying to study some of these responses and kind of something that um, the Iowa group can tackle with the pig and some of the other animal models. But what do we see in uninfected patients versus infected patients and how do you correlate those, those responses? Um, and there was a question about a link between potential um, fungal infections and how this changes the types of responses that you might be seeing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess that kind of relates to me. I wanted to ask, um, ask Alice as well, um, because I think there was a question too about Oh, controlling for the sputum in con um, healthy controls in CF when you're measuring your metabolite levels, um, how much does the sputum processing and potential dilution to get the sputum or how much does the variation between the, the samples that you get, does that make it difficult or affect your ability to measure the metabolite levels? So um, those were all, the, the sputum collection was done by Clemente Brito at Yale and they have some ongoing uh, bowel studies. So we've done enough of these. You saw the clustering is pretty close and it's relative. So we didn't give you absolute numbers. We gave you relative, they can be relative to standard uh, metabolites. So yeah, there is dilution. You know, you, you guys, the pulmonary folk know better than I do about you know, how, how much fluid you put into when you do your lavage, but these were all part of a standard protocol. So they were, um, we're pretty confident and that the, healthy controls, you know, were people that were intubated or were being bronched that were comparable at the same time. Yeah. And I don't know for some of your studies as well, if you were able to have a chance to look at sputum from different patient populations, or maybe was there sputum from someone who was more heavily pseudomonas infected? Did that change the succinate or attaconate that you saw yeah, so versus, I, or did you have any uninfected patients and were, what, what did the levels look like there? So Kira Tomlinson from my group has a nature communications paper, um, and I think it's January of 2021, where she looked at staff. And in that paper, we have a figure that shows bowel fluid, again, from Clemente at Yale, and what the patients were colonized with. So we were mostly looking for MRSA at that point, but several of those patients also had pseudomonas. And you see, they still all have too much more ataconate. So um, it didn't really matter what they were infected with. It's more of a host response. <coughs> Um, we can also tell you the CF community doesn't care about this, but there's a huge ataconate response to Klebsiella, particularly the multiply drug resistant strains. Mm. So I think it's just, it's a metabolite that people didn't recognize as having such an important immune function and, and it's just being recognized. And it's clearly, I think, important in CF. I'm, I'm curious, you, you introduced the, uh, um, uh, the question of why Pseudomonas and not these other gram negatives. Um, uh, Pseudomonas prefers these metabolites so much more than the than the others. Uh, uh, is, is E. coli not able to acquire a taste for them? Well, you know, bacteria are very adaptable. But uh, let me just mention that Pseudomonas, Aspergillus, and Mycobacteria all have the three genes or have the genes you need to metabolize ataconate. Um, and I don't believe in coincidences, like and none of these other organisms do. Staph um, uh, responds to ataconate by making buckets of biofilm. And I'm very eager to see if the initial high ataconate in CF has anything to do with staph colonization. You know, 40% of people have staph in their nose, but when CF yeah. kids have staph in their nose, even infants, they very frequently can't clear it, but you and I can clear it. So yeah. why is that? Um, and staph doesn't eat ataconate. Um, so no, Klebsiella doesn't like ataconate, but it will, uh, it changes it, 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 it stimulates ataconate production and it changes its own metabolism in response to ataconate. And um, the early data said that ataconate was antimicrobial, but clearly the organisms can deal with it. So when you ask about succinate, it's really, you know, Pseudomonas is one of the few uh, that has all of the correct properties. You can stimulate it very readily to make, um, to make biofilm through ataconate or through reactive oxygen species. Uh, actually, Pradeep Singh published a paper 20 years ago in PNAS. He just hot dropped hydrogen peroxide on PaO1 and it got mucoid. So mm -hmm. it's very responsive to oxidant stress. The CF lung has much more oxidant uh, release on a cellular level than normal cells. So you take an organism that 
loves succinate. It's going to eat it all up. It's going to adapt to succinate, and then it's going to use ataconate. There are not that many other gram negatives or even gram positives that also can become resistant to antibiotics that can live in that environment. So do you, do you see just pseudomonas in other diseases like uh, ciliary dysplasia, or even in COPD, there are also P10 abnormalities. So there's a relatively, this, you know, considering all of the bacteria, uh, I'm not saying that the anaerobes aren't there and playing a role, but I think that these predominant pathogens, um, particularly there's very nice data to show that the, the mucoid pseudomonas correlate nicely with bad lung disease in CF, as do the small colony variants of staph. Um, as does MRSA. And there is a real clear association with some of these pathogens that all have similar metabolic adaptability. Does that sort of help? Yeah. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm wondering too, because you mentioned it, is there a difference in where you find ataconate or succinate in the, is it just in the lower respiratory tract? Have you looked in the oral cavity versus the upper respiratory? And is that something that might change whether in CF or non-CF individuals and then kind of predispose where you can find some of these organisms living? So there, there's data from Seattle that says that uh, and, I, and it wasn't reproduced by other groups, but it's, it's, it was presented earlier this week that there are different organisms in different, not different organisms, different pseudomonas in different mm -hmm. parts of the lung. And then there's intriguing data that I never saw published from Alex Asher. Uh, she presented it at a CF meeting um, where there's high, she also showed high succinate in CF. And her um, work showed that um, there were, she thought there were different macrophage populations in different parts of the lung. And so you could make an argument that, um, that the more immunostimulatory uh, organisms, the ones that uh, still have flagella and pili and LPS are gonna activate macrophage populations that are more pro-inflammatory that are making IL-1 beta and they're mm -hmm. gonna release more succinate. So if you have a bunch of those you know, in one part of the lung, they'll, I think they will predominate and you'll get a micro environment. Um, my favorite shtick right now, and if anybody in my lab is listening, they'll cringe, is that many of these chronic infections are much like tumors. So you've got um, foreign antigen that's proliferating and they're gonna activate an immune response based on a lot on their antigenicity and on their metabolites. And so depending upon what they surround themselves with, that will define in many ways your immune response. And so I could see in chronic CF, you've got this replicating mass and you're gonna have a lot of ataconate that's very anti-inflammatory. And so you're not gonna get the brisk immune response. And I think that might be important when you look at Jay's um, uh, T cell responses. T cells are very important, needless to say, in recognizing foreign antigen and becoming activated. And so it, on the one hand, you've got too much activation early on, but then the organisms adapt, and then you get this anti-inflammatory response, much like a slowly progressing tumor later on. So the problem is how can you, how could you correct that? And um, I'm very eager to study, um, and I think uh, Ben Kopp will have some of the data. I'm eager to study what happens to macrophages and importantly neutrophils when you give them highly effective modulators. If you correct, if you put CFTN in the membrane, you're gonna put P10 in the membrane, you're not gonna have excess succinate, you're not gonna have excess ataconate. So that will remove at least one of those pressures. So then you might get more fulminant infection early, but I think not. I think you'll have normal clearance because you'll have enough early inflammation to clear the organisms before they can adapt. Yeah, thanks, thanks for uh, referring to uh, Ben Kopp uh, and his, his work. He, uh, he gave a really nice talk in the workshop yesterday um, showing improvements in macrophage function uh, in response to triple modulator therapy. Yeah, I want yeah. him to measure P10, but I don't think he's heard me. <laughs> <laughs> ben, if you're out there, um, I think that leads really nicely into another question playing right into what are the effects of modulators? And I guess this applies to a lot of the different talks today, but the question specifically was for Alice um, and whether or not there were differences in ataconate or succinate that you could measure post um, um, beginning modulator therapy, if you've been able to get samples to look at that. But I'm also curious how that might even apply to, for Jenny, for the antimicrobial or antiviral activity. Do we see any differences if, if you could treat the pigs with modulators um, as well? So, so the samples yeah. are in the freezer. The, mm. We have human PBMCs from kids who are starting therapy. Uh, and so we want to batch them and we're actually practicing 
Uh, neutrophils are not so easy to study. The mononuclear populations are easier, just as actually Ben Kopp mentioned at the workshop yesterday. Um, so we will definitely want to look at that. Um, I'd be very eager to know what the story is in the pigs. And um, it's easy to I mean, the nice thing about working with a, a protein like P10 is that it's all over the cancer literature. So if you'd like to get some anti-P10 and do some facts <laughs> on your piggy cells, I think that would be totally cool. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we have talked about doing, you know, studies in the G551D pigs and looking to see, you know, pre and, and post Ivacaptor treatment, do you see a difference in antiviral responses at least? We, we have not done that yet, but it's uh, something that is of high interest. The, the other thing I, I need to mention is that P10 doesn't care about the channel function. It just wants the channel in the membrane. So um, that will account for some of the variability you'll see in our results. So it doesn't care whether the, the channel is open or closed. It just wants it in the membrane. Mm. That was actually a specific question here on the, uh, um, on the sidebar asking about um, whether CFTR is at the cell surface or retained in the endoplasmic reticulum. So, so it's mostly about where it is and not whether it's working. It's on the mitochondrial membrane and it's on the epithelial membrane. And that's, that's where we care about it. And I think all of the references for that work, it's, that's all published. And the references are in my talk. Um, there's a recent cell metabolism paper from 2021, uh, from 2020, that's Sebastian Raquelme's work. And the, um, the data with the CFTR mutations uh, was in a science translational medicine paper from I think 2019. I, yeah, I, like I, yeah, I guess related to that, there was uh, another question that came up recently about, you know, we see a lot of high pseudomonas in patients with bronchiectasis, and they also have CFTR. So can you explain anything there about maybe the relationship with P10 and CFTR, because that should be taking place there, yet we still see the high pseudomonas? So. What I could say is, again, the relationship between oxidant stress, once you have inflammation and you have lots of succinate, Pseudomonas is going to thrive. And once it starts replicating at a high rate, it generates its own oxidants and you're going to turn on the glyoxylate shunt and you're going to turn on the biofilm formation. So I presented a slide that showed if you just grow pseudomonas with um, uh, glucose or glucose plus ataconate, and that would be the case in somebody with bad bronchiectasis without CF, you're going to get lots of ataconate produced by their immune cells and that's gonna drive pseudomonas to make tons of biofilm. And I, I omitted the slide because I was already talking fast that shows that biofilm, you know, not only does it have an anaerobic environment in the middle, the bacteria aren't replicating so that the antibiotics don't work, antibody doesn't work, complement doesn't work. So the organisms are just in heaven, <laughs> bacterial heaven. I wanted to uh, ask a question to Ryan um, since we haven't haven't gotten him uh, involved yet. Um, in, when when looking at patients with CF and examining their their uh, microbiome, it seems like there's this bewildering array of of different organisms that are present, and each person has their own different microbiome that's that's also quite different from from one another. Um, how how are these differences established? Um, what, why, um, you know, the, they all have the same disease and, and many of them have the same canonical pathogens. Why do they seem to have different supporting, uh, communities that are around them? It's a great question. Um, uh, open and no open ended, maybe unanswered question. Um, you know, I think, I think it may boil down to more, um, of some of the emergent properties of these communities. So it might not necessarily boil down to their specific composition, but rather what they can all do collectively as a whole and how, you know, maybe, maybe it's a, a select group of, of um, keystone bacteria, if you want to call them that, that lead to more severe disease outcomes or acquisition of a specific pathogen. Um, that's a great question. And, but in terms of how they, how these communities are forming, um, it, you know, it could be that the environment is selecting for, for which organisms um, are proliferating, uh, who gets on the scene first, and that might select, um, you know, for downstream organisms and whether or not they're successful in colonizing. I think the early community dynamics and how they're selected for um, is, is not known. I think it's a, it's a great um, 
question to to attack. And, and you know, in terms of the the new technologies um, that are that are being developed, I mean, I mean you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, getting together with this large group of this consortium of people who study this. How how uh, are new technologies going to um, lead to answers to those kind of questions? I think one of the I guess consensus um, ideas that came out of that workshop was just really work towards more um, uh, relevant in vitro models that can accurately recapitulate the in vivo environment on the lab bench. I think uh, those are limited right now, and I think that the better we can we can reflect what's going in going on in the host, including involving the host in some of our our bacterial models, um, will be key to understanding what's what's happening there. Yeah, I was struck by some of the data that you were showing in your talk, Ryan, about the, the use of broad versus narrow range antibiotics and how that affects anaerobe populations, but also putting that together with some of these ideas about the antibiotic cross protection that could be provided because there've been some nice talks. I'm thinking of one yesterday in the hot topic section um, symposium on antimicrobial susceptibility testing in CF and how there's this kind of dichotomy of what we should predict the bugs to do um, some of the traditional pathogens when we test them in the lab, but then we don't see that follow through in, in treatment success. And I'm wondering if you could you know, what's the role of anaerobes there? Because that's definitely something we're not taking into account when we test these aerobic pathogens in the lab to look at their susceptibilities. So it seems like there's something complicated that could be happening there as well. And maybe anaerobes Absolutely. are one of the big confounders of why that's not working. That could definitely play a, a role. I wouldn't say that's, that's the only factor. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, the host anaerobe pathogen dynamic is a lot different than culturing mm -hmm. Uh, the, the primary or a single isolated pathogen on LB or, or BHI in a, in a clinical lab. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more, uh, the more relevant um, host and microbial factors that we can incorporate into these models to, to study why uh, at times antibiotics that, would, that are predicted to be uh, effective fail um, uh, will be key to improving upon, uh, upon the therapies that we, that we choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can't imagine putting that type of system together with anaerobes, pathogens, antimicrobial susceptibility testing. It's going to take a lot to get there if that's in progress, but it would be great to see, you know, the, the impact that has. I had a follow-up question about long Tony's lines, if I may ask. Um, when, you know, Tony, when you asked that question, it made me think about um, Tina Harder's work and, and trying to study the link between RSV and asthma. And she, she mined the TenCare database in Tennessee, and, and she found that birth month so if you're born three months between the RSV season was an inter independent you know, risk factor. Uh, now that this was in a maternal asthma risk, there was a risk, maternal asthma risk group, but you wonder whether birth month, I don't know if anybody's looked at birth month in CF and, and uh, we probably have that data in the, the yeah. data to see how that influences things. Yeah, I've, I've wondered about a, a variety of other factors, like do, does the family and the diet that they eat, do they, you know, establish this um, microbiome early on, uh, severe infections early on, you know, lead to some bottleneck that, that um, you know, renders the, the person having a, a, um, a population that's maybe different than, than the usual Oral hygiene as well. Yeah, could be a potential determinant. Yeah, they're, they're maybe are, not in infants, but as they as they start to age. Yeah, I think that that this is is really a, a big unanswered question. Let's see. Um, we had uh, we had a couple uh, questions for Dr. Coles that we uh, um, have haven't gotten around to. So. Um, one of them is, uh, have you tested your mouse model, um, this humanized IL-22 uh, uh, model with other CF pathogens such as pseudomonas or non-tuberculous mycobacteria? Is there any evidence for a different persistence? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't done those studies. We're focused on staff. And of course, since IL-22 has been linked to a uh, citrobacter, um, in rodentium, which is a gut pathogen, we've done some pilot studies with Citrobacter just to validate the, the model. But um, yeah, that, that work's ongoing. So I don't have any data with them. Um, um, just pilot data with staff right now. Yeah. And then there's a, 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 
uh, related question on do IL-17 and IL-22 correlate to IL-22 RA2 expression in your CF patients? And are you able to oh, that, measure accurate? Well, that's a good question. So, yeah, we see IL-22 transcript, but what's interesting is the downstream genes of IL-22 are downregulated, consistent with the functionality of this decoy receptor. Um, I haven't seen where IL-17 I haven't seen where IL-17 has been. A, a, uh, we don't have any evidence that IL-17 would directly regulate IL-22 or I-2. It, 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 the data to date from all the single cell data suggests that it's really made by macrophages and dendritic cells. Um, but what the upstream transcription factors are remain unclear. But. Um, we have a question here for Dr. Prince. Uh, the two CF strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa um, causing atacinate um, were from patients at early or late infection stage. Oh, you might be muted, Alice. I'm muted. I'm yep. sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> um, le le I mean, what's late? They were established colonization in an adult. Um, and you saw we had them, um, we had those strains over several years, but they're certainly established colonized strains. Yeah, I'm curious, have you looked at environmental isolates of Pseudomonas and their responses to attacking yeah, the uh, and actually, is that really different? It was actually on one of those slides. We have ICU isolates that are much more acute and they have not mm -hmm. upregulated their attacinate eating genes. Mm -hmm. So it does take a while for them to decide to eat attacinate. It takes time to acquire new tastes. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, another question to uh, Dr. Hunter, uh, protective action of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Have you any clue why Rothia strongly pops up during the second year of life to become the prime bacterium in a healthy uh, and CF airway microbiome to replace um, streptococci, but then is suppressed to lower levels? Uh, a short answer, no. Um, um, Pseudomonas was mentioned at the beginning of that question. Can you run that back for me? Is there a, is there a protective effect of, a, oh, this is getting back to the Rothia data showing that Rothia the protective against Pseudomonas colonization. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't I don't know what the me specific mechanism is. I'd have to go back to see what they were proposing in that paper. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great observation. I have no, I have no idea why it would would hop on the scene early in year two and then subside again. It's probably some well combination of host and bacterial interactions for sure. So an, an alluring observation, but we don't really know um, yet. Um, and then uh, uh, we have a um, a question again on on P10 CFTR interaction. Um, have you compared P10 mediated responses in people with cystic fibrosis um, where the protein is at the cell surface available for protein protein interactions compared to F508 DEL where the CFTR is not at the cell surface? So I think um, I didn't show you all of that. It's in that first paper where we had PBMCs, um, we looked at just the intersection of, of the expression of, of P10 and CFTR in people with different mutations. And if you look through that list, you can find some of the other mutations where they don't intersect, uh, where the P10 and the, and the CFTR don't intersect, they're in different quadrants. I think that, that might be the, the data they're looking for. And I'm sure if we did more, we could, we could hone in on that a little bit better. Um, I wanted to, uh, um, circle back to the viruses, um, again, and, and, you know, the, the challenging experiment here, uh, of giving influenza to the pigs, um, I, one of the, one of the confounders here is that if the pigs don't kill the virus as well, um, then you may have a dose de dependent difference. Um, the, the effective dose is higher in, in CF. So how much of the um, increase in inflammation do you think is, um, is due to higher effective viral dose? And how much do you think is, is due to just the intrinsic pro-inflammatory yeah. state in cystic fibrosis? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
And it's hard to answer that the way because it could be on the one hand, it could be that the pigs are having a bigger interferon response because they're just they have more virus there. So they're having a proportional response to a larger amount of virus. On the other hand, they might be having like sort of in hy a hyper inflammatory response. Um, and it's kind of hard to sort through that with in this experiment. I will say that in past experiments with these animals, we have done um, experiments with, again, with newborn CF and non-CF animals, and we gave them um, heat killed Staph aureus. So it, it, staph that had been heat inactivated um, with the idea that we would be giving them a stimulus that would be specifically inflammatory. Um, and we'd take out the the confounding issue of, of the bacterial replication. And we did see differences in how the CF animals responded um, to that to that type of inflammatory stimulus, um, which suggests that there is um, something that, that um, some sort of an intrinsic di difference in how the epithelia or um, the inflammatory cells, how they sort of their level of responsiveness to inflammatory stimuli, there does seem to be a difference between the CF and the non-CF. Um, so yes, yeah, so we, we, that could be a contributor here. And, and how about uh, other non-infectious, but uh, uh, danger signals like poly IC or um, CPG, yeah, we... DNA, you know, Right. We haven't tried that in the pigs. Um, I don't think we've actually done a lot with poly IC or other, you know, damps or pamps, um, like in cultured epithelia. We actually have not done a whole lot of that so, yet. That would be interesting to do, though. I'm wondering with uh, uh, Dr. Coles, um, in, in the... Uh, um, in these people who had increased uh, lymphocyte production, uh, was it done in response to a certain subset of Staph aureus uh, or a subset of Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Do you have information about the, the bacteria uh, that might be provoking um, these immune responses? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I mean, for the screen, we use, you know, lab strain. So we use Newman and then the isotonic protein A um, mutant. Um, uh, and then for Pseudomonas, we use um, a mucoid isolate from that we got from Jen Bomberger. In our serology studies, um, we we use uh, lab plectonic strains as well as mucoid strains. And what's interesting is that as Alice Prince taught me years ago, that, you know, if you if you took a shower this morning, you got, you know, 10 to the eighth uh, Pseudomonas. We find uh, anti-Pseudomonas antibodies just in healthy controls, but you really find the anti-mucoid antibodies uh, only in the, the CF uh, cohort. These are all adults with CF. And, and some of it's alginate, but uh, even if you take alg uh, mutant strains, um, there are antigens that are uh, unique to CF. And one of the ones we identified with by IP mass spec was um, OPRI. Um, so, um, so, you know, um, yeah, so uh, it's, you know, it's a, I, think it, I think the serological response will depend on where the patient is and, you know, it, uh, in their course of disease and whether they have uh, a dominant mucoid strain or still kind of colonized with an early planktonic strain. So I think it's a co-evolution, you know, the, you know, and we, it's the same thing that happens in the gut microbiome, right? Um, you know, you, you make this, you know, huge IgA, huge T cell response that kind of hopefully keeps your microbiome healthy. Um, and then, you know, CF, obviously the microbiome is abnormal and the immune system is probably trying to catch up, but it's, you know, too little, too late. You know, as you know, IL-17 really needs bicarbonate transport to be effective. So I would hypothesize on correctors when you restore bicarbonate transport, you know, your IL-17 cells will now work oh, <laughs> and actually okay. start clearing pathogen. And then as you clear pathogen, there's less antigen. So your T cells will contract. So I, you know, it'd be interesting to look at T cell responses in patients on contractors, uh, on correctors, but I would, I would predict that they would go down as their antigen load goes down. And I think we kind of touched on one of the questions that's still out there for um, for Jenny, but as far as which other viruses have you looked at with the ASL <laughs> secretions, and one that I don't know if we talked about, but I'm curious if you have looked at SARS-2 and if there is any different antiviral activity in, in CF secretions versus non-CF from maybe younger or more mature yeah. pigs or animals. We have not. Um, that would be very interesting to do, and we just um, we haven't tried it. 
only so much ASL that can be for testing. <laughs> yeah. Tedious yeah. to get. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, right. I think we've addressed most of the main questions that have been um, submitted via the chat, but I'm sure if anybody out there has remaining questions as the session kind of wraps up here, um, please feel free to reach out and contact any of the speakers um, via email, and I'm sure they'd be happy to, to chat more offline about some of these topics. But um, unless we have some other questions remaining out there, um, I would just like to say thanks again to all of the speakers for some really fantastic informative talks. And it'll be really interesting to see how some of these fields progress with modulators as we get more data on the PROMISE trial and, and some things with Trikafta. Um, but also, you know, I could see something like the gut and CF becoming a bigger field too, where we think about some of these types of host pathogen interactions and how that interplays with disease. Uh, maybe in future years, we can return to the host pathogen topic and come back with some new stories. So, Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Thank and you. Megan. <laughs>